I animated six terrifying cosplay horror stories submitted by real cosplayers over on the Spacecraft Discord. And our first comes from Lil Miss Flower. Swift was enjoying a lovely day at an anime convention with his sister, Miss Flower. Though he'd mostly just been following her around because he hadn't done much prep when it came to researching the con. Miss Flower had taken care of most of the logistics, like securing the tickets and learning the schedule. This left Swift ready and poised for his doom. Because eventually Miss Flower decided to leave after a long day at the con, and despite losing his leader, Swift stayed behind, knowing that the con had a rave that he didn't want to miss. So Swift ventured off alone into the con's artist alley, where while perusing Pokemon plushies, he happened upon an interesting group, a flock of folks in fursuits. They complimented his cosplay and struck up a conversation, innocent enough. And after a while, they invited him to join their little group and head off to a party. Swift, assuming that meant the rave, enthusiastically agreed. Though if he had looked at the schedule, he might have known that this party wasn't the rave at all. The furries led Swift over to main events, not an uncommon place for a rave, but the room was still full of auditorium seating. And the furries led him to sit down with them in the front row. At this point, Swift figured that this couldn't be the rave, but didn't know how to leave now. So he just sat and waited patiently for the rave to start. And then, a glimmer of hope, music starts playing up on the stage and out walks... Spider-Man with a can of silly string. The furries had taken Swift to an 18-plus cosplay burlesque show. Like I always say, when in doubt, do as the furries do. Our next story comes from Discord user... Chara. Chara had been sewing and cosplaying for two years when she started taking on commissions making cosplays for friends, only charging them for the cost of materials. To her, it seemed like a great way to get experience while saving money. But generosity like this is easily exploited. A few months ago, a friend, who we will call Flowey, asked if Chara would like to do matching has-been hotel cosplays for an upcoming convention. Flowey also insisted that they hand make the cosplays because Flowey didn't want them to look cheap. Chara agreed to make both of the cosplays if Flowey could pay for the materials, but Flowey asked if Chara could reduce the price and let them delay the payment because they'd recently been laid off. But they insisted, Don't worry about it. I'll get a job in no time and repay you, I promise. Then Chara asked when the convention was. It was in two weeks. That's enough time, right? That is not enough time. But Chara agrees anyway, and in a few days, they've got a wig coming in the mail, and they head off to the thrift store, where they find a jacket pretty close to what they need for Flowey's character. But Flowey says, It's not the right shade of red. It's too long, and it, it needs, needs a, a white, white stripe. stripe. And after 20 minutes of arguing about how it could be altered and how they only have 11 days, Flowey tries it on. Oh, it actually looks... Pretty good. With a large piece of the cosplay acquired, Chara starts on the props, a spear and a microphone. And she decides to try out thermoplastic beads, little pieces of plastic that become moldable when you heat them with water. The spear fails, but the microphone comes out okay. But when Flowey arrives to see the props... Ugh, it's a little short. Can you remake it? Chara says no, that there's not enough time and that this one is already done. But Flowey says, But it looks so lumpy. It, it looks too handmade. Stunned, Chara says that they can take the microphone home and work on it themselves. And they do. Later, Flowey's wig comes in the mail and Chara cuts up one of their own black wigs to add in the extra color needed for the character's two-toned hairstyle. It takes her a long while, but she's happy with the result and sends it off to Flowey. It's the night before the con and the phone rings. It's Flowey. They weren't happy with the length of the wig and their solution was to rip out the black hair Chara spent so long adding in 
and add in their own longer wig by duct taping it. Flowey had also painted over the satin stitching that Chara had added to that thrifted jacket for the white stripe, with Flowey saying, I didn't like that stuff, so I fixed it. So I shouldn't have to pay you, right? Oh yeah, you forgot the bow tie. Can you make one? Chara made the bow tie. Flowey complained about that too, but they would have to be happy with the cosplay at this point because the con was tomorrow. Flowey shows up in the cosplay without the microphone, saying, Well, it was so lumpy. I tried to sand it with a power tool, but when I did, it just kind of melted. They had dremeled through primer, paint, foam clay, to the point where they got to the thermoplastic and melted it. Also, it wouldn't look homemade. Flowey then entered into the cosplay contest with the cosplay that Chara had made for them and proceeded to blame Chara when they didn't win. I think the only lesson we can learn from this is don't be a bitch, don't do commissions, and when people tell you who they are, believe them. This next story comes from Wolfus Cosplay. After a lengthy train ride of heavy suitcases falling on top of her, Wolfus arrived at a small convention and joined up with their friend. On the second day of the con, Wolfus wore her new Cult of the Lamb cosplay, which they wore with some stick-on fake boobage. Or chicken cutlets, as we call them. They were meant to enhance the strapless dress's sweetheart neckline, but like raw chicken, they came with their risks. This cosplay was one of the first things they'd ever sewn, and while they were proud of the accomplishment, the cosplay was becoming the bane of her existence. The heavy skirt was constantly pulling the bodice down because it was only a single layer of fabric. Not enough to hold up those sticky boobs. Though thankfully, Wolfus had a cape, otherwise they might have shown a couple people those chicken cutlets. However, the dress wasn't the only thing slipping. Wolfus couldn't walk five minutes without their tights slipping down. She constantly had to stop, pull the tights up, walk five steps and stop again and pull the tights up again. This became particularly problematic after Wolfus and their friend play a few rounds of Dance Dance Revolution, where after Wolfus retreats to the bathroom to repair all the slipping the dancing had done and try to put a stop to it all for good. Though when Wolfus reaches the bathroom, they find several serious business type looking people attending a different convention in the same event center. She gets a couple of strange stares, but heads into the stall for the repairs. Inside the stall, Wolfus reaches down to pull up those tights one more time, but as soon as she touches those tights, the chickens flew the coop. The sticky boob hit the floor with a nice loud wet smack before rolling its way into the adjacent stall. There's a shocked gasp from the other stall and someone awkwardly kicks the sticky boob back home. Too embarrassed to exit, Wolfus watched through the gap in the stall to see one of the serious business ladies leave the stall next to them. Wolfus waited for the business people to return to their mandatory meetings before returning themselves to their friend, Chicken Cutlet, now in a bag. This is like the most common horror story when it comes to your first handmade cosplay. This happened to me. My first handmade cosplay that I wore to a convention completely fell apart on me. And it is why I always say that the only goal for your first handmade cosplay, it doesn't matter how good it looks or how well it's made, your only goal is to not fall apart. This next story comes from Yuki. Yuki was cosplaying as Azula at her local anime convention as a very special guest. Why? Because she knows how to light up a stage. She's a literal fire dancer with 11 years of experience and a circus arts college degree. Sometimes though, your wealth of experience can't stop other people from making something a total nightmare. Yuki was set to do a full fire performance with Fire Poi and Fire Fans outside with an emergency staff on hand because she's a professional. Also, because it's fire. 
As the sun set and the crowd gathered, Yuki soaked her props in kerosene and started the performance with the fire boy. And the crowd was excited. Maybe a little too excited. As Yuki performed, she wasn't facing the fans that were still soaking in the kerosene awaiting the second part of the performance. She needed to focus on the performance and, you know, not setting herself on fire. Since, you know, it's fire. Then the horror happened. There was a burst of cheers from the crowd and Yuki turned around to see that a visibly drunk con attendee had clambered into the courtyard grabbed her fan and set it on fire. A drunk person in this situation is bad enough. What was worse though, was before a fire performer lights their props up, they shake them off so that they don't get kerosene on themselves because if you do, you know, it's fire. You know what happened when the drunk person with kerosene lit something up? Well, it's fire. He set himself on fire. Stunned, Yuki could do nothing but watch as the emergency crew rushed in to save the drunk and take him to the hospital to treat his burns. If you work with fire, please remember, just because you abide by the correct safety regulations, it doesn't mean that other people know them. So always remember to have somebody guarding the kerosene or you might end up with a drunk idiot challenging you to an Agni Kai. This next story comes from Zalichi. Zalichi was preparing for a cosplay contest at a new and very small convention. They had competed before, but this contest was a little bit different. It allowed both craftsmanship entries for handmade cosplays and performance-based entries. So you could enter a purchased cosplay and you would only be judged on your performance or enter a handmade cosplay do a skit and be judged on both. Or at least that's how contests like this usually work. This contest did not actually differentiate bought and handmade cosplays for the prices. Through some online research, Zalichi discovers who the judges are. The con organizer's girlfriend, the con organizer's friend, and a friend of a friend of the con organizer. None of whom had ever judged a cosplay contest before and only two of whom even cosplayed. Zalichi had also assumed that like most, if not all costume contests, they're free to enter as long as you have a badge for the convention. However, the day of the contest, they discovered that they'd actually have to pay five euros to even enter. But Zalichi pays the entry fee anyway and goes off to prejudging where the incredibly qualified judges would get to see their cosplay up close and use all of their extensive cosplay knowledge to evaluate how well made that handmade cosplay was. Yeah, that's not what happened. The contest's judging was based on a rubric that Zalichi has kindly translated for us. All costumes purchased and handmade would be judged on criteria like, give us an iconic quote from your character. During Zalichi's prejudging, the judges sat filling out their rubrics and didn't even really try to get a good look at the cosplay. But hours later, Zalichi takes the stage to perform their skit the stage show then ends at three o'clock with the award scheduled for six o'clock. But after some outrage, they moved it up to four o'clock. And in third place was a handmade Barbie cosplay. In second place was Zalichi. And for best in show, it was the judge's bestie, who according to Zalichi, this cosplayer wore a purchase cosplay, didn't really have a great skit, barely styled their wig and sewed a cape with seams on the wrong side. Though all three winners did receive the same prize of 25 euros each taken from the pool of participation fees. With the contest over though, the judges actually left their filled out rubrics behind in the changing rooms where it was discovered that Barbie had 13 out of 14 points, Zalichi had 13.5 out of 14 points, and Best in Show had 15 out of 14 points. So not only were the judges unqualified, they also didn't seem to be able to do basic math. While it's actually really common for judges to know multiple contestants as years of competing will just lead to everybody knowing each other, reputable judges will often be way more harsh on people whose work they know. Because if you know what somebody can do, you're gonna be looking out for their best. So it's not always nepotism when somebody that's a friend of the judge wins. 
But when it is from nepotism, it's not hard to see where it doesn't add up. This last story comes from Macaulay, and I have to warn you that it's actually pretty terrifying. A long time ago at an anime convention in Switzerland, Macaulay and her mother were having a great day together. People were stopping in droves to ask for pictures of Macaulay's cosplay. And eventually, Macaulay's mother decided to go off on her own to wait in line for a custom drawing from a Disney artist. Macaulay, now alone, is waiting in the halls of the con when a couple approaches her and says, can I ask you something? Assuming they want a photo of her cosplay, Macaulay agrees. So me and my fiance are taking part in this challenge to get some money for our honeymoon. I have to ask cosplayers to lick their feet. And the more feet I can lick and take a photo of it for proof, the more money we get. And your shoes seem to be easy to get in and out of. And you're not wearing socks, so would you mind? Flabbergasted, Macaulay shrieks, yes, I'd mind! Shocked, she tried to be as nice as possible. She tried to tell them that, that her feet were sweaty from the con. And then she tried to inform them that she was a minor. But the couple persisted. Now maybe even more encouraged? Then the fiance chimes in with, if you feel uncomfortable getting your feet licked, maybe a kiss on the toes would do? Or maybe I could do the kiss since I'm a woman like you? Macaulay is panicking. The couple was insistent. No version of leave me alone or hey weirdo, I'm a child would stop this couple from relentlessly reveling over Macaulay and her feet. And when all seemed lost, a roar came from behind. The couple turned from their bipedal obsession and standing there with a freshly inked doodle of Daisy Duck was Mama Macaulay, ready to tear this couple apart, toe by toe. The couple retreated. Macaulay was saved. And what came after was a chill day at the con for Macaulay and her mama bear. The con upped safety in the following years after a series of roaring phone calls. Remember kids, the coolest thing you can do at an anime convention is bring your mom. Thank you so much for watching. If you want to support the channel directly, you should check out my Patreon. You'll get some exclusive content like a weekly live stream that I do just for patrons. But if you're just watching, liking, commenting, subscribing, sending the video to a friend or your mom, or subscribing, please subscribe, then you're supporting the channel too, so thank you. And hey, it's October, and that might mean that in your area, early voting is going to start soon, or maybe it's already started, so you should go do that, or go vote on election day, uh, because you should, because the only thing more terrifying than any of these stories is Project 2025 and you have the power to stop it by voting for Mama Kamala. So please go do that. And a big thank you to my newest big support tier patrons. Nemesis T-Type Susie Sheep Cosplay. Inside Sepiplier Edits. Autumn Days Jeweled Triumph. Stoic Harlequin and Kiru. Thanks so much for watching. Bye! Ooh.